Sugar from New York City Emergency Management, and we have two, but hopefully soon three amazing speakers from the community who are going to talk to us about how they will be addressing the needs of asylum seekers. As an immigrant myself, this is a topic that is very near to my heart. I have been working with immigrant communities uh, here for over 10 years. Uh, and that's how I started my work in emergency management and I work on language access. Uh, and so thank you for being here. I am here to introduce our moderator, Derek Thomas, who is the program manager on the legal and support initiatives team and the New York City Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs and has served as the on-site lead at the Asylum Seeker Resource Navigation Center since, since its launch in September of last year. Before joining Moya, he conducted legal orientations and screenings with detained unaccompanied migrant youth at HIAS Pennsylvania. Derek has also worked as a program and research assistant at the Center for the Study of Social Policy and is a trial crew leader in, the, in AmeriCorps. He graduated from the University of Florida with Bachelor of Arts in History in 2015. And Derek will introduce our panelists. Thank you. So we have a distinguished panel today. Um, I'll introduce them one by one. So we have Robert Ayamang. Um, the New York Director of African Communities Together. Um, Robert is the New York Director of African Communities Together. He was selected as a member of the transition team of the New York City um, of um, New York City Mayor Eric Adams, and is an executive board member of the New York Immigration Coalition. Mm -hmm. Robert previously served as the Director of External Affairs for NYSAFAH. Working to advance affordable, um, pro affordable housing policies, and also served as a director of communications for state assembly member um, Ranisa Ebishog. He has also served as a campaign manager and strategist for several successful New York um, based electoral campaigns. Robert received a Master of Arts in Political Science a Bachelor of Science in Psychology, and a Bachelor of Arts in Africana Studies, all from Brooklyn College. Robert is Ghanaian American and is a native of Brooklyn. So we also have Lorena Corusias, um, the Executive Director of Mixteca. So Lorena stepped into leadership as Mixteca's Executive Director in May 2019. She has devoted her work to building a social movement that moves away from mainstream systems and with non-conventional approaches and has maintained a strong track record of serving underprivileged communities. Lorena believes in women's and community power. She mirrors her experience of learning a new language, assimilating to a new culture, and overcoming the migration process, um, physiological trauma with newly arrived immigrants. Lorena earned her bachelor's and master's degree in psychology from the National Autonomous University of Mexico and holds a master's degree in social work from Hunter College, CUNY. She has received numerous awards for her work. So, Nilvia Cortez is still not in, she will be arriving soon, but she is the Executive Director of New Immigrant Community Empowerment, also known as NICE. Um, so, NICE builds the individual and collective power of immigrant workers with a focus on newly arrived immigrants and day laborers, organizing impacted immigrant workers to fight for their dignity and workers' rights in Queens. Nilvia has over 18 years of experience in public service and nonprofit organizations, both in Mexico and the U.S. She is passionate about immigrant rights, economic and labor justice. Her work includes community development, advocacy, and education programs that are culturally tailored to dignify and empower immigrant communities. She holds a bachelor in political science from CIDE in Mexico City, where she graduated with um, a nationally awarded dissertation and an MPA from um, in migration and development from NYU Wagner. Nilvi is an enthusiastic advocate for social justice, particularly regarding Latino undocumented workers' rights, and currently lives in Brooklyn with her compañero de lucha, her baby um, Naya, and plants. So we'll go ahead and get started with the questions. Um, so can you describe how your organization supports asylum seekers who are arriving in the city. This is open for both of you. Of course. Thank you so much. So thank you for that, Robert. So thank you for the introduction. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And uh, 
I hope we can share some of the information of the work we do. So Mixteca, it's located in Brooklyn and uh, just in the middle of six different hotels that become shelters at, at this point. It really close by the new Herc in Red Hook. And with that, I can give you the idea of the number of people that are going through our doors seeking for services. And uh, Mixteca provides services in four different areas, mental health, health, immigration, and education, in the intersection of those areas. And with the asylum seekers getting into our doors, we have been expanding. And I, it's not really with the asylum seekers we start with COVID. So those were our four services. And when COVID hit, as you may know, our community got really affected by COVID. And we extend our services into emergency action. And we have now uh, food distribution, we have community fridge, and we always try to tailor the services according to the needs of the community. We know that accessing to food is being a big issue. After COVID, and I don't know if I can say after COVID, or <laughs> since COVID, maybe can be better since COVID, many of our community members lost their apartment and they are now living under the BQE in Brooklyn. So with that said, the, the food access to those communities is being really difficult for them. Uh, we start distributing food and then we realized we were not there 24 seven and they need food, whether they are uh, the day laborers that didn't get the job for the day and they need something to eat by the end of the day, or even if they get the job, they may didn't get paid for, for the day and then they need some, some food. So we open our community for each, which is outside from the organization. And that's an invitation as well for the community to be part of the solution. The community fridge or the Mercadito Solidario, the way we call our food pantry, which is kind of solidarity market, but if you don't speak Spanish, in Spanish sounds really better. Because it's like a, Mercadito is the place when we go for vegetables and fruit, and solidarity, it's like a, it cannot be the other way. So the Mercadito Solidario, you can go over there, and we wanted to give them the experience of getting, picking the fruits and vegetables they want. So during the Mercadito Solidario, you can see signs and uh, how many items you can take, and you can decide take it or not to take it if you don't want to. And the Mercadito Solidario is tailored to the needs of the community. With the asylum seekers getting there, then we have to sweep a little because it's cold and we do this on the street. So what we did for is to create vouchers with the local restaurants. We work with the local restaurants for them to get food and get dignity because they also deserve to be seated in a restaurant to at least having one meal and to decide whether they want to get the quesadilla, the torta, the popusa, the ayaka, or whatever they want to get. And so uh, we provide them with those vouchers. We've been trying to implement our program of vouchers with the local supermarkets as well for them to pick whatever they decide to pick or whatever they need the most at the supermarket. And so we provide services from giving them clothes, toiletries, uh, soap, detergent, whatever the need is around, because some of the hotels didn't have uh, laundry rooms. So they had some clothes at the beginning, and then they didn't have a place to wash their clothes. So we were trying to get detergent or collaborating with the local laundromat for them to go there and being able to wash their clothes and not to throw the clothes and get another one from the donation the donation place. But we go from the emergency needs to the mental health services to reconnect them with their community and to welcoming them into the community. We had over the uh, last year, we did some novenas, some culturally appropriate celebrations for them to feel that they are welcome in our neighborhood. And uh, mental health is a big issue, so we've been doing some uh, 
work around mental health with the community. And the community is eager to learn. We've been developing another program, which is called TELAR, uh, that is the workforce development, which is tailored to the needs and the particular needs of the community, because you may know this if you just do uh, job readiness, interview, and provide clothes. That's not what they need at this point. So we have ESL classes, computer classes, and many more things that I don't want to get you, uh, make you sleep now, but we, we're going to be discussing through this conversation. And I also want Robert to have some of the space to talk about his work. Thank you. Thank you. Of course. Um, oh. We're doing a lot for, oh. for the community, so. Mm -hmm. uh, hats off to you. Uh, the response to the, the crisis of asylum seekers and, and people coming in waves to New York has been a lot. And so, you know, I know that Mixteca is doing a lot. You know, African communities together, we're doing a good amount, but I do want to make sure that I highlight that we're working in collaboration with a lot of other community organizations, specifically in the African community, because this is a community effort to be able to respond to what's happened. Mm -hmm. uh, there, and maybe some of you have read some of the articles that there are some mosques that are holding some, some of the folks who've been migrating uh, helping them to get acclimated to what's going on. We're, we're working with some of those mosques. We're working with other community organizations and individuals. We're trying to, to meet everyone where we can, right? So uh, for those who don't know, African Communities Together is an organization of African immigrants working to improve the civil rights and the human rights of Africans here and abroad, right, uh, just to truncate it. So we do immigration legal services, we do navigation services, we do um, immigration rights presentations, community advocacy, and we help to train and develop community leaders and help usher them into uh, advocacy. We have several chapters, one in Pennsylvania, one in the DMV area, and the primary one has been in New York from, from, its, um, from the beginning. So in response to what's been happening, uh, we've been open for all sorts of collaborations, but also we've been able to, one, help identify folks for whether they need specifically uh, help with their asylum case through our immigration legal services. Some folks do not qualify for asylum currently. And so we also try to connect them with other resources that may be available to them at this time, whether it be trying to help connect them to some housing, connect them to uh, specific language support for whatever language they may speak because that will also open up them being able to understand a little bit more of the situation that they encounter when they come here. Uh, also working to get them some care packages, which depending on the timing of when they arrived and came to our office, it would have been different clothing for the season. Uh, we helped them with cash cards to help them to be able to get on their feet, we connect them to other different programs that may be helpful to them. And we try to make sure that we're consistently in contact with them. We help them with what has been known as, or what is known as change of venue or change of address to help usher along their, their legal case. So in the event that they're able to pursue asylum, that they're able to get access to working authorization sooner. And there's, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so I, I, let me mm -hmm. make that clear, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know the exact specifics of the legal ramifications, but there is a certain length of time that has been happening with a lot of the, uh, a lot of the cases 
And keep in mind that in New York City, there was already a backload of legal services and, and being able to get immigration legal services kind of moved through the court system. There's been a backload for years. And it became heightened dur during the beginning of the pandemic. And now with the, on the influx of all these new folks, it has worsened around the country. And so them sending folks here just created an even more worse, rigorous backlog that the city has had to try to work through. So there's, there's a lot that's happening and you know we're, we're a part of just a committed, dedicated group of community advocates, folks, organizations who are trying to do every part they can to help get these folks to a better situation than they were in before. I guess to follow up on those two great answers, and thank you for all the work you're doing to support um, asylum seekers and migrants arriving in the city. But how does the asylum seeker population differ from other communities that have sought refuge in New York City over the last few years? And how does this impact their need and the approach your organization is taking to supporting that need? I mean, there are different and not too different, but maybe we can touch some of the points. And, and thank you for mentioning not everyone, because in the news we usually hear about the Venezuelans, the Colombians, but there are not only Spanish speakers that the ones that are getting here, the asylum seekers. And we know this is an issue, a complex issue that is being related to what is happening around the world and why we are getting here people at this point. And so the point or the main difference, welcome, Lydia. and the main Sorry. difference, the main, di she was in a, in a issue in the train, and, but <laughs> we, we were holding the space for you. you. And uh, uh, as an EDs, we have to run into many things all the time. But anyway, uh, I think the main difference is the number of people getting at the same time in the same point after one crisis, which was COVID. And again, I say after, maybe it's my wish that is after <laughs> COVID. But since COVID, we got, I mean, cover, COVID just highlight or put the light into the needs that were not covered in the communities. Mm -hmm. How the communities were left out from many of the services. Now, with the number of asylos, asylum seekers seeking for services, you just can imagine. And, and I can say all the services we provide, and I can say that is insufficient. I can say that no matter how many uh, codes I got today, I need more. I can say no, no matter how many uh, support groups I get today, I need more. No matter how many people we support with ID NYC, NYC care, fair, first, we need more. And talking about lawyers, it's another big gap for the community. And I think that's another, another situation. It really put us on our toes to see how the advocacy has to be tailored to support these communities if we don't want it to see this crisis repeating over and over and over and over because this crisis is really reflecting what is happening in all communities and how all communities have been neglected. And we are talking about language access in many groups. We've been discussing this part for many years. At Mixteca, we translate services into different indigenous languages as well. But it's not enough. And then we had all this group of big people, big number of people that speak different languages. And we realized that we don't have enough lawyers, we don't have enough social workers, we don't have enough people that speak these languages. And uh, I think that's some of the differences. And uh, the number of people, and I don't know, maybe my, my colleagues can speak a little more about the difference, because I just see that they are so similar at the community we've been serving for many years. Mixteca has been there for 22 years. 
and the crisis by crisis is just trying to address the needs that the community is facing. Yeah, uh, she's absolutely correct. And if I can just add a little bit, the difference is, is I mean, there's some legal differences, right? Again, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> I just want to uh, want to make sure it's very clear. I'm not a lawyer. There are some legal differences for folks who are seeking asylum, as mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to some of the other legal ways to become documented in this country. Um, there are some differences, but a lot of it looks the same because we've been catering to these com to our communities for so long. We know people have been coming and trying to find ways to improve their lives through different channels, different borders, and all these different things. Uh, the one thing that, that I think stood out was just the immediate support that was needed because of the overwhelming numbers that came. They, uh, this population of folks became a political tool. Mm -hmm in all the back and forth that's been going on between the governors of Texas and Florida and you know sending people to to New York and I think I believe some landed in DC some started landing in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia some started landing in uh, Massachusetts but it was they were being used as a political tool and most folks were not prepared to be rushed and shipped off into these places. I believe the city has, has noted that we were, we're looking at a little bit over 50,000 that have come over the last year. My inclination it has probably been more than that mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. there's some that have not been identified but have been there, you know, or have found their way into the city. And so we're, Though the focus has been politically to address the folks who have come on those particular buses, as community frontliners, we've been responding to everybody who's been coming, anybody who's in need, anybody who has identified that they're looking for a better way of life. So legally, there might be some, some distinction between folks who are seeking asylum and may have an actual case for asylum under the under the law, but it looks very similar to somebody who may need uh, a renewal on their TPS status, or somebody who is uh, who came here and may have been petitioned for by you know somebody else, but maybe have been left or have had a traumatic situation where they can no longer be around that person that petitioned for. Right, so uh, we want to, like, I, I, it's, it's, it looks the same, but it's different. And, you know, we're trying to make sure that, and, you know, Lorena mentioned mental health. Mm -hmm. This particular scenario that has occurred has really propped up the need for mental health support for everyone within this dynamic. Right, both the folks needing support and the folks that's trying to help them get support. It is a very big undertaking, and I think that you know the city has been responsive in some ways. You know, given the the timing and the crises that that has happened, there's not enough conversation about mental health, mm -hmm. and there's not enough, uh, and and not to take away from the groups and the folks who have been staunch advocates for mental health for, for many years in all the different areas, the conversation around mental health has to increase and change. And it, it's very, very much highlighted by, every, by everything that we have incurred over the last, I think we're coming up on a year now, mm -hmm. where the increase of folks coming to New York City has, has begun. So. Yeah. 
Yes. Um, so I guess piggybacking off that mental health point that is so important, um, and not just this crisis, but um, in the immigrant experience more generally, um, what um, role does supporting asylum seekers' mental health needs take in your work? And what is your staff doing to maintain positive mental health, both as individuals and as an organization? Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you, um, Robert, Lorraine, and Derek. Uh, my name is Nilga Coyote. I'm the executive director of NICE, New Immigrant Community Empowerment. We are located in Jackson Heights, Queens. We are one of the biggest CBOs in the area. Um, I apologize. <laughs> I'm late. I come from there. And as Lorena was saying, there's thousands of people coming to us, so we have a lot. We have a lot of work to do, and we have been doing a lot of work. And, and just to, I want to respond to your question, of course. Um, I just want to add that I do agree that this new population is, is somehow different at those as, in those aspects. At NICE, we have also been around for almost 24 years. And this is not the first time that we receive newcomers, right, newly arriving immigrants. It is different because of the numbers and how massive it is and how over, overwhelming it is and how they are involved in this political game. I agree, right? Um, but even before the pandemic, we started seeing a change in our demographics and in the profile of the people that we consider our members. Our mission is to organize immigrant workers to build individual and collective power. And we do that through a combination of strong workforce uh, development program with training and education on workers' rights and uh, advocacy and other support, uh, yeah, support services tailored to the immigrant communities. And of course, one of our main role is to empower them to become their own advocates and, and, and to defend themselves. We, are, we have mostly worked with people who will be uh, working in the construction industry because the construction industry is one of the highest paid in the, in, in the city, but also one of the most aggressive and one, one of the most deadliest, um, of course. Uh, as you know. Um, we also work in different industries such as cleaning services, retail, restaurant, etc. And going back to my point, before the pandemic we started seeing a change in the profile of the newcomers. We used to focus on day laborers. That's actually part of our history. We were born because of the corner at 69th Street on Roosevelt Avenue. The, the men, mostly men back then, uh, gathering to wait for jobs and for, wait for an opportunity to be picked up, right? Levantados. Um, we have a worker center, and that's the place where people are safe and they're able to bargain their own salaries and their and you know to demand better labor conditions and safety uh, while they do their jobs. But again, going back to previously to the pandemic, we started seeing more and more people coming from Colombia, Ecuador, with a different educational background with college degrees, with masters, but moving, coming to the US, looking for an opportunity. Then we saw a lot of people from Ecuador going back to the day labor profile, a little bit, you know, indigenous communities, uh, unfortunately, people with less opportunities in their home countries. Once the pandemic hit, of course, we saw the amount of need in the whole area. Of course, Jackson Heights, Corona, Elmhurst being the epicenter of the pandemic, it was literally a tragedy, as I know, because we work with the same community, and we have seen the increase of need, like, I don't even have the word, like, exponentially. And now, <coughs> with this new crisis, as we call it, the new crisis of asylum seekers, I agree that the profile is kind of different because of, of the legal aspect, but, and just to make it very short, where I see the, the similarity with our history and our past is that all these people who might be currently in a legal limbo are in need, in dire need of a steady income, of mm -hmm. a job, of you know, uh, an opportunity to contribute to this uh, country, this economy. Um, so right away that uh, the crisis started back in April, I remember we started seeing a lot of people coming to us, more people, hundreds. And um, 
as probably you know, our former ED, now commissioner of um, Moya, we were in contact and I'm like, what is going on? This is, we have been seeing a lot of people. And of course we started seeing the response of the city and, and, and organizations such as Mixteca going to Port Authority. I have to recognize that like, and so many mutual aid groups, incredible, doing incredible work. Um, when we were asked to do the same, I was like, tied, you know, my hands. I was like, how, why am I, how can I send staff at 3 a.m. and what do we have to offer? We provide OSHA trainings, we provide site safety trainings, you know, preparation for uh, the workplace. And of course, that's what they need, but not at the moment they were arriving, yeah. our mm -hmm. right? And so I knew, we knew that they were going to come anyway. And that's, that's actually where it's similar. All these people, they don't have a job right now. They don't have legal services. So mm -hmm. how can I get a lawyer to, to even initiate my case, mm -hmm. right? They Change don't even know. Mm -hmm. They think that they're already in the process. They, they don't know they might be actually in removal proceedings. Um, so they, they have come to us and we knew the expertise of NICE is workforce development, is training. Um, we are able to do that and, and not in the scale that is necessary because if we really were able to do that, like, I don't know, hundreds of organizations, hundreds of institutions should be providing us uh, support and resources because that's also something important. We provide culturally tailored in Spanish for free training. Otherwise, all these thousands of people will be there already, but there will be more and more in numbers victims of fraud, abuse, and scams. Mm -hmm. That is already happening, right? Mm -hmm. Because these people are despair, our, our entire need of jobs or training, of knowing their workers' rights. They are taking already jobs for nine, 10, 11 dollars per hour, and they're risking their lives. And I'm just gonna stop there. And going back to your question, Derek, mental health. I, I just wanna, you know, like mention about Lorena is, is uh, I just wanna reframe like what she's saying, like mental, the mental health crisis, we have seen it in our, in our community since the pandemic. And now, of course, we are engaging with a community that is a victim of so many crimes during their journey mm -hmm. to, to the US, to New York, that evidently we have seen an urgent need of more mental health programs. But then again, I'm gonna say, it is important to know what is the community you are working with. Mm -hmm. Another difference is that these newcomers don't have the family ties a lot of other groups have in New York or even in the US, they come along. Just yesterday, I was in an interview with an asylum seeker who is a new member of NICE, she's a woman, and she had a horrendous journey. And they don't have access, we don't have access to mental health programs. And whenever we were, were able to refer to other CBOs who provide that, they don't speak Spanish, mm -hmm. talking about lingual justice. Or they provide this um, during the evenings, right? And and they cannot bring the child. And, and those are, all of these are barriers and obstacles for our community members to get access to those so important services. What we're trying to do at NICE is to do what we know best, which is how can we heal as a community, in community, uh, have conversations, sharing our stories, uh, creating solidarity between immigrant communities, because that's another issue we have seen, and that is extremely mm -hmm. sad which is a, a narrative, a, a, a division in the narrative uh, cut from members who have been with us for many years, asking why are these people getting so many opportunities that we don't have, that we didn't have? Why are these people, these people getting housing, getting uh, you know, a potential work permit, uh, a job, a preparation for jobs, when so many people so many immigrants in our in our ranks have been fighting for those benefits for years with us. So that's what we create. Like, how can we close those uh, those that division, create those bridges, and just listening to each other? Because at the moment, Nice is not able to provide those mental health programs because we are concentrating on the workforce development, on the training, on the workers' rights, on know your rights, on political education. Uh, pushing for changes that will benefit this community. But we are looking at other organizations. I know that, for example, Misteca, and 
I'm not gonna let it explain you or mistake explain you. Um, they have other models, but I think that again, if we wanna if we wanna be able to create something together with the city with other agencies, they need to listen to us and to our community members on how to cater their needs and how to meet culturally, and and, and how can we provide programs that are dignified for our community members. Thank you, Nilvia. Uh, yeah, there are many things that I wanted to mention in terms of uh, what's coming to mind in the difference of this community. And uh, I'm seeing more families, mm -hmm. the full family. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe because of the hotels around Mixteca are family shelters. And, but the number of families immigrating together from the baby or the pregnant, mm -hmm to the baby, to the teenager, to which opens this big need of services in mental health. Mm -hmm. As the family witnessing the trauma of the others. So we have traumatic cases that I won't explain here because I don't want you to go traumatized to your home more than we already are. But uh, the, the examples are terrifying. If, if they are really like something that we've been listening to other immigrants, but now it's the mom witnessing what happened to their children during the journey of immigrating to this country, which in the past was one person getting all this trauma and maybe not sharing it with anyone in the family, but now they are witness of what is happening. And we can't just look on the other side and say, okay, the issue is too big, we can't do anything, we do our best, and we do our best. But something that I keep in mind, and I'm trying to think as, Nil as Nilvia was talking, is what are we doing for ourselves? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, through this, nothing. Neglecting our health and our mental health as a service providers. We do our best but at this point, the crisis is so huge is. and so overwhelming that it's hard to say, you know, I'm sorry, I'm gonna do some mental health and I need time off and I know I need it and I know my staff need it, but it's so hard when you, ha you are facing this uh, crisis that you need to respond to that one because we, as you may notice, maybe you didn't, you haven't noticed that my first language is Spanish. So my first language, language is Spanish and many of these community members are Spanish speakers. So where do you think they are going in Brooklyn? Mm -hmm. So they go over there to ask us all the questions, mm -hmm. all the questions that what we are learning with our legal partners process, clinics, getting the training, mm -hmm. and getting really like a lot of information on how to support them in the basic legal, I don't know if I can call legal, but basic changes that they have to do, at least to understand and to know their rights in the workplace, in the legal, to them, to prevent a little to being victims of fraud. And yeah. I'm seeing Derek a little nervous, so I'm thinking like, a, I'm talking too much? You no, no, no. Those are, it's those are all, <laughs> it's actually nodding, it's, it's an agreement. Oh, okay, okay. So mental health is critical. Yeah. But, and I wanna mention this and highlight it, mental health in a way that our community heal. Mm -hmm. No mental health, no mental health sending them to the hospital. Yes. That they're gonna be there in a waiting list until the psychologist that speaks Spanish. You know how many? How many they are in the city? I don't, but I know how many people get really like into maybe 12 or 10. Oh, yeah. and, the, and, the, yeah. and then it's like what we create is community healing. Healing spaces where the community yes. support each other. Yes. Healing spaces where you, all of you, can come to our sites and volunteer one afternoon yes. a month. 
and maybe support one person to get their metro card in a 50 percent discount yes. if they already have the money mm -hmm. because many of them don't don't have for a 50 percent discount but maybe for the id nyc you support them mm -hmm. putting the application mm -hmm. because it's what they need yes. or maybe you have an extra detergent at home, yes. and then you can bring it to them with respect and dignity, mm -hmm. because that's the most important part. And I can be here talking so really long, how many times we got donated clothes at the beginning that they were for the garbage. And I was like, a, oh, oh, okay, let's learn as a society the, if I'm gonna help someone, I'm gonna do it with dignity and with respect. Yes. Uh, should I, I, I use and I wear these clothes? I'm gonna give it to the person I love the most. If the answer is no, then don't send it to Mixteca, yeah. to, to Nice or to La Colmen. Yeah. Don't do it, don't do it, because then it's more job for us. You have a time, you can volunteer at our sites. You have some expertise come and volunteer that expertise. And it doesn't have to be every afternoon after work and I'm also tired. One afternoon a month or every two months. Or, and you can also make a difference. You speak another language, you speak an African language, an Arab language, and Spanish, then you can come and translate with us and support them doing some activity. And so we do a lot like, uh, uh, different activities in terms of mental health and healing spaces that can accommodate a large number of people because the number of people is always large. It's like we used to post everything in social media and now we don't do it. <laughs> we are afraid of getting so many people that we just can't. It's like, uh, and, and that's the reality. We do some stuff and we, we just, keep it quiet because we don't have the capacity to provide the service to everyone seeking the service. But I think uh, we need to do more in all the, in, in each area and it's important to everyone from here to get involved and not just, I know we are the ones talking this side, but I, I really encourage you to reach out to the closest shelter, to the closest MBO, CBO and then do something, whatever is that, something that you can do. Uh, I'll just echo everything that they had just said. Uh, we're working, because it's, it's a working, active working practice to incorporate, we call it, you know, we're calling it wellness into mm -hmm. our uh, into our program for staff. It's a it's an active, ongoing process, and and trying to make sure that it's incorporated that those who are interacting and interfacing with community members daily, uh, that they understand that sometimes you know as they mentioned some of the situations that people are coming out of are just so heavy. I'll, I'll call it heavy for the you know. It's so heavy that when they leave you, it is still resting on you, mm -hmm. and you take it home, and you know you. And it's not a situation that many can resolve mm -hmm. by themselves for another person, right? So it's it's something that we're we're consistently looking at, trying to adopt ways to make sure that our staff is being able to take the necessary time to address their their wellness in, in whichever way is helpful for them. Uh, the things that we can try to do for the new residents, I'll call them. Uh, you know, speaking to someone in your language that you know is there to look out for you after you've gone through a great ordeal to get here, it is a big relief to some folks, right? Uh, especially some some of our, uh, our African brethren, when they get here and they, they can connect with, you know, whether it's our community navigator or some of our, our organizers, and they're able to talk to them 
but not in a, a, a very chopped way trying to say the right thing, but just freely communicate. That's a relief to them. It's just, the, and then to hear that we're here to help you, we can try to serve you in some way. We won't get everything for you, but we'll do everything we can and we'll connect you to trusted partners so that your, your situation, though it won't change immediately, it won't be forever. And we'll try to continue to work with you so that it's re, you know, you're in a better place every time that we can meet. So it, it's helpful in some ways, you know, there's we've helped with community organizing, um, dinners and, mm -hmm. and clothes drives. And those are also opportunities to meet with folks and talk to them, recognize the humanity in them. You know, they're not a number. They're not uh, a political tool. They are people, genuine people, that have gone through traumatic things mm -hmm. and are just trying to do better. Mm -hmm. Just like every one of us, right? We've all been through traumatic things and we're just trying to do better. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I'll, I'll just add that. To end then uh, on a point of strength and um, healing, what is a moment or two of joy that highlights the impact that your organization is having on the lives of asylum seekers as they integrate into New York City? Mm. I can go in one, but I think. So I, I think that I really love what Robert just mentioned about rec recognizing the humanity of our brothers and sisters. That's how I express about uh, our new, new our newly arrived immigrants, newcomers. Um, and just to give an idea, of course, as I mentioned, we started noticing hundreds and hundreds of people coming to us. But just to give you an idea, uh, in December, just new members coming to NICE, we have 872. Just new members in a month. Then in January, 1,007. Then in February, 880. Oh wow, there's a little, a little difference. But it has really radically changed since the summer or April. I, I, I came back from maternity leave in January. So when I left in October, it was 375 in a month, but now it's just like crazy. Um, so that's, the, that's why it is important to keep that perspective because Otherwise, our brothers and sisters become just a number, and they become a, an anecdote, unfortunately, or a political strategy, a political momentum uh, in the career of, I don't know, right, in some careers. But these newly arrived immigrants are New Yorkers. They're, they are here. They're, their wish is to contribute. Mm -hmm. For us at NICE, Yes, we organize to fight for our dignity and for worker rights and for changes, but we also fight for the right of our joy, the right of our happiness. Mm -hmm. And obviously hearing how we can positively impact on our community members is always a reward from us. It's always the highlight, is the joy. Um, I have heard a lot of stories and a lot of journeys from people, as when I was saying, very harrowing. And I have to say, as a Mexican, I don't feel proud that all these thousands of people who cross our, my country, our country, they have to deal with a lot of, a lot of the systemic issues over there, a lot of shit that is impacting on them so bad. You know, like people kidnapping them for money and as Lorena was saying, doing horrible things to the entire family. So the result is, and it's not only Mexico, it's also the politics of the US in other countries, of course, right? And, and, and I imagine other places. Mm -hmm. um, but just listening to somebody who has, who has gone through so many um, cruel situations to say, wow, you were the only one to help me, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. very touching. Just yesterday, this member, I'm gonna call her Laura, she, she was telling us, I come from Colombia, and we have been abused and, and scammed during all this journey, right? Living in Colombia, arriving to Mexico, 
getting to the border. Right in the border, we were kidnapped and we spent four days in a horrible place until we paid for a ransom, and then we were left at the border. And in a church in Arizona, somebody told us, go to Nice, go to Roosevelt. And, and they were like, what? We don't even know what that is. <laughs> and the moment they were able to come to arrive to New York, they came to Nice. They found Nice. And one of our staff came outside and asked, are you okay? How can I help you? And these people were literally wearing the only clothing they had after all these horrible, disgusting situations and tragic abuses. And even if we give them, you know, a, a soup, a maruchan soup, like <laughs> not <laughs> very dignified, not very healthy either, <laughs> these people haven't ate yeah. weeks, days, I guess, right? So giving them clothing, giving them food, and, 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 and finding a place to stay, right? NICE has, since 2021, we have referred to 580 cases to shelter. This is before this. Like, we have seen a lot of these families coming, as Lorena was saying, entire families coming. And so even this woman came back and told us, I stay at that shelter, and I'm still at that shelter, and my husband got the ocean assist training with you guys, and I'm in the waiting list to get the training. And fortunately, I'm gonna be able to find one day a job, right? And little by little, mm -hmm. trying to help them little by little, that's, that's, that's the way we, we are doing this. Like, it's not possible to get everything at the same time, unfortunately. Uh, but hearing those stories back, and, and, and people are really grateful. And that gives me joy, but at the same time, it gives me a lot of rage. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of um, energy to continue, because we cannot say that joy is just the fact that a person is, is safe in a, in a shelter, mm -hmm. right? Or is just trying to get, even the husband, I know the husband is making $110 per day as a construction worker, and that's actually super low. You should be making 150 Like, there, there's already a lot of wage debt in that situation, like red flag. But still, when you hear the story, it's just like, okay, yes, this is the joy that we are trying to bring. And, and again, community. Having a family, making the organization your family and your community, it's something a source of joy for our community members and for us. I'm going to say that. I'm sure you're going to say lots more better things. No, so. no. I can't say it better. Yes. <laughs> no, no. It, it, it just made me think that like there is no small action. I can think on many happy times because even though we've been discussing heavy stuff here. If you go to our places, we are always smiling. Everyone is happy there. Whether because we have some hot meals, because we got we got the burritos on Tuesday, so today <laughs> is a happy day. The yes. Combi Foundation gave yeah. us burritos since mm. April 2020, yes. until now. Wow. And so if you're gonna go to a Mexican restaurant and you're gonna pay for that food, Go to Tacombi that is giving us that food every single time and every single week we receive the food. But whether it's Tuesday for burritos, whether it is people getting some clothes that they love, you don't know how much, or a toy. Kids yeah. are so happy with toys. So we gave them a toy and they are like a you fix all their experience with one toy. And it's not a toy, I always said, People come to our organization seeking services, but they actually are seeking a place to belong, mm -hmm. to be part of. And then when they find those places, they feel like, uh, this is amazing, this is going to be fine. And they are really grateful for all the, the support they receive every single day. Or the person who got already their driver's license, mm -hmm. yeah. not speaking, not even one word in English. <laughs> but he went there and we were like, yes, you can do it, you can do it. And then he did it. And then how did they do? He's a, he's a paramedic. It's fine. He's a paramedic from Venezuela. And then it's like, I need my driver's license to try to find some type of work here, but I can't wait until I learn English to go and get this license. So they got the license 
there are people with a lot of skills, with a lot to contribute here mm -hmm. to this country. And uh, those are happy moments. And, and it's true. If you go to organizations thinking that these people are crying all the time, no, it's not. It's like we did something with churros and uh, Valentine's Day because La New Yorkina and other restaurant mm -hmm. donated churros for our a community for each birthday. It's <laughs> like we celebrate whatever we can celebrate. So it was the birthday of our community for each, and they donate those churros, <laughs> those churros that they were in a shape of hearts, and they got the churro, and they got some really cool drinks, and we talk, and those are happy moments, and those are spaces for us to heal together with yeah. the community and also us because we yeah, feel like not sure. everything has to be all these like uh, amazing mm -hmm. resources a lot of money we do all this we do all this mm -hmm. with really few dollars yeah. mm -hmm. few dollars yeah. and uh, yeah we 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 get into many uh people that have donated and support us and 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 that's that gratitude also on in us help the community because we feel like Nilvia mentioned and thank you for for mention Tacombi is like so much gratitude for those burritos getting there every mm -hmm. single Tuesday without missing one day from starting of the COVID pandemic mm -hmm. when we wow. I was called by the ED and she said how are you doing and I'm like bad <laughs> really bad <laughs> And I have three buildings by Misteca, and no one is working, and uh, we can't go around, and you know, the city closes, uh, closed, and then uh, she's like, don't worry, don't worry, we're gonna get together, we're gonna get through this one. I, I'm gonna send you some, some food, and at that time, they were cooking meals, and it was hot meals. Mm. The burritos come after, because we have the community fridge for them to grab a burrito mm -hmm. from there, and. Uh, but yeah, there are many happy moments, many happy moments. Thank you for asking that question because uh, when we get the partner offering honest the real partnership, it's another happy moment. It's like not the partner looking for what I'm gonna get from this, but the partner saying, you know, here you go. It's like, here is like, a, I have, uh, I don't know, sometimes they call me, I have it, I have these tortillas and uh, from the, uh, Vista Hermosa, I have boxes of tortillas. You want them? They're really sure. Good, by the way, oh, yeah. Yeah. they're one of the oh, best. Yeah. I can tell you. Send those tortillas, and then and they're expensive. And maybe I'm, I'm not hungry, but I'm talking about food a lot. But there are many happy moments. <laughs> that if you want to uh, share those happy moments with us, volunteer with us. Mm -hmm. Where's the list? You gotta send the list around. Yes. <laughs> you have a captive audience. Yes. <laughs> So uh, there's there's been some moments of, of joy that we've experienced with folks. Uh, there was, and my team they've they've interacted with some folks. So like when they've given them a cash card, people mm -hmm. will just start crying on the spot, mm -hmm. and then they start crying, and then everybody's crying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And there was there was one time they called me so that I could hear this person just praying for them, for their lives, because they've just done such a wonderful thing for them. Yeah. So there's been plenty of moments I wish I had one of my team members to just tell you <laughs> some of those experiences. The one that I can point to was just like a few weeks ago where this young man came and couldn't speak English, but he came to our office on one of the days where our office was closed, but he was just like in need of somebody to, to point him in the right direction. So I, I went and I tried to talk to him. We couldn't really talk. He gave me the phone because he was using like Google Translate. Yeah. <laughs> he was just like this. And then so I took it and I typed out the response to him and he just gave like the <laughs> deepest sigh in the world. Yeah. It's like finally, somebody like recognizes me so, finally somebody is going to help me you know somebody that looks like me somebody that you know can can help me in some way and 
it was like you you think back on these things sometimes and it's just like you you don't know what was behind that side but you understand that that side was so necessary for that person in that moment. so uh, those those are the things that that have come to mind for me let's have a round of applause for this So that's all for today. Thank you so much for attending the session. Thank you again to the panel. And um, looking forward to continuing the partnership. Thank you.